Okay, hi everybody. This is David Gully from Bentley University. This is another monetary policy update as of April 2020. Uh, please, when you have a chance, uh, or visit our uh, YouTube channel, Bentley University EC391. Uh, we have a lot of videos uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, federal funds rate, the balance sheet, our star, uh, all kinds of things that any student in either an intermediate macro or a monetary policy or a money and banking course might find very helpful. Uh, I also recorded a video uh, in March uh, that gave some details of the Fed's policy uh, moves uh, at that time. And this uh, particular video uh, updates uh, those. The Fed's done a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, talk about what they're trying to do overall and also talk about how well it's working. So some background, uh, the coronavirus has had a major impact now on world economies and financial markets. Uh, supply chains have been dramatically disrupted. Uh, to uh, translate that into um, uh, uh, economics terms, that's reduced short run aggregate supply, higher uncertainty and all kinds of other factors have reduced aggregate demand. Uh, various government actions, including travel restrictions have affected both aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply. And it's very likely that the net impact is going to be reduced GDP growth, uh, severe recessions in many countries, and lower inflation, if not outright deflation. And this is also happening at a very, very fast rate. So we've already seen uh, in the United States unprecedented increases in jobless claims, 22 million over the last four weeks. We've seen, seen sharp declines in economic activity indexes. Um, whole sectors, retail, for example, uh, restaurants, et cetera, are shutting down. Commodity prices, including oil, have plunged. Uh, and with that, we're seeing the lower, uh, a risk of lower inflation, if not outright deflation. And we've also seen a dramatic capital flight uh, out of developing countries, and that's gonna impact them pretty dramatically. So in terms of how things might, uh, how bad things might get, uh, this is from the OECD. Uh, it's a forecast uh, for this year, uh, Canada, Germany, France, Great Britain, Italy, and the US. And roughly speaking, the net uh, estimates here are uh, down around 25 percentage points, uh, which would be unprecedented in terms of uh, both the speed uh, and the magnitude here in modern times. So unsurprisingly, the Fed has taken a number of actions. We'll talk about these in our video here. Uh, they've lowered short-term interest rates to zero. Uh, they are now uh, using what they sort of uh, referred to in some jest, uh, QE to infinity, uh, buying treasuries and mortgage-backed programs through their large-scale asset purchases. Uh, they provided liquidity to banks and other financial institutions through a variety of lending uh, programs and they're creating credit facilities to make sure the financial markets function in these very abnormal circumstances. And already, even though it's early, and even though some of these programs have not yet actually started functioning, financial markets are responding pretty well. Things are not normal yet by any stretch of the imagination, but it seems to have had some effect at least a little bit. So in early March, uh, they started ramping up some of their uh, actions. They said they would act as appropriate. Uh, March 3rd, they cut the federal funds rate target by 50 basis points. Uh, and then in mid-March, they dramatically upped their repo operations, up to uh, op daily operations of up to $500 billion. Um, and these were either uh, overnight repos or term repos of up, up to three months. Uh, so then uh, on March 15th, uh, the really uh, heavy artillery came out. Uh, they went back to the zero lower bound, uh, cutting the target range of the federal funds rate to zero to a quarter percent. Uh, they move back to using forward guidance. Uh, what they're trying to do here is to uh, convince us that we're not going to be not going to be lowering or not going to be uh, reducing uh, support to the economy until things have gotten uh, much much better. Uh, and what they're the whole point here is they're making sure that we believe that these policy actions are not going to be short lived. They're going to be here for probably a very very long time. Uh, they also cut the discount rate down to uh, uh, 25 basis points, and they've encouraged banks to borrow uh, with loans that up to 90 days, and that's had some marginal effect. Uh, surprisingly, they cut the required reserve ratio uh, from 10% uh, down to 0%. They've also uh, in, uh, begun what's called uh, dollar swaps uh, with other uh, world central banks. The idea is to provide dollars uh, into the world financial system, given the importance of the dollar as a reserve currency. They also started a, another QE program. Uh, there, the initial uh, announcement on March 15th was at least $500 billion in treasuries and at least $200 billion in mortgage-backed securities. Since then, they've effectively gone QE to infinity, as noted earlier. 
Uh, and they've also, and this is particularly interesting, uh, encouraged banks to draw down their liquidity buffers. Uh, post Great Recession, uh, thanks to some regulations and a little bit of risk aversion on the part of banks, banks build up, build up a lot of uh, capital and a lot of liquid assets. And the idea is the Fed's trying to encourage the banks to, to make use of these to provide support to businesses and to consumers. So on March 23rd, uh, they took some additional action. Uh, the, uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, policy statement from the ECB from Mario Draghi saying, we're going to do whatever it takes to save the euro. Well, this is the Fed's whatever it takes moment in terms of trying to make sure that it's doing whatever it can and whatever is necessary uh, to support the U.S. economy and to support the overall functioning of financial markets. So then also previously mentioned, the Fed is now engaging in effectively unlimited uh, QE. Uh, to give you an idea of the scale here, at one point they were buying up to $125 billion of treasury and mortgage-backed securities per day. Uh, so compare that to the height of QE in 2013, uh, when they're undertaking about $85 billion per month in mortgage backs and treasury. So the scale is, is far more dramatic. And they've also resurrected some old policy tools uh, and they've created several new ones and even beyond that, uh, additional ones since then. April 9th, uh, some yet more new programs, expanding some of the existing programs that they had just announced uh, and uh, the details of another program that they said they were going to introduce but didn't provide any information. In total, these are expected to provide around uh, a little over $2.3 uh, trillion of support. Uh, the balance sheet is now um, over is about six and a half trillion dollars now, and there's estimates that might go well past uh, 10 trillion. And they've also made it very clear that if they think that more needs to be done, they will do more. And what we'll see in a minute is the Fed has taken on some dramatic uh, uh, default risk onto its balance sheet, at least to some extent. And the Treasury has backstopped the Fed, at least till now, up to about 450 uh, billion dollars, though the Fed has other methods to try to recoup any losses as well, and we'll mention that. So the Fed has introduced a total of about uh, 10 new uh, lending facilities here. Uh, some of these are holdovers from the Great Recession, and, and a few of them are brand new. And the general idea here is to provide support to financial markets so they carry on functioning. And it's the general functioning financial markets, making sure that buyers and sellers can find each other, making sure the firms can roll over debt and sell new debt and so forth. That might be much more important than the Fed lowering the federal funds rate down to the zero lower bounds. And all of these things that we'll talk about here, they're all effectively variations of the, the lender of last resort, meaning providing emergency support for the entire financial system. And as we'll talk about, uh, the Fed is kind of moving into some fiscal policy uh, for better or for worse. And what they've done with several of these policy tools is they've, they've enacted them using their section 13.3 uh, uh, for unusual and exigent circumstances. So we'll go through these one at a time here. We'll, we'll skip a lot of the details, but it's, it's helpful to do a survey. So the first one is the primary dealer credit facility. Uh, this one is uh, very similar to the standard discount window, except it's uh, for use by the primary dealers. Uh, these dealers are uh, large institutions like Merrill Lynch and Goldman and so forth, and they run the secondary market for treasuries. And the, the intent here is to uh, be a lending facilities to these particular dealers, given how important they are to the U.S. financial system. So the dealers can put up collateral, and the collateral includes treasuries, uh, commercial paper, mortgage-backed securities, and, and now, as uh, is, is noted here, even some equities. And so this is brand new for the Fed. And so on their balance sheet, the Fed gets um, a, a primary dealer credit facility loan, and on the right side, uh, we'll have reserves. And then... Uh, the whole purpose of this is to give dealers uh, necessary cash. And so right now the interest rate on these loans is just the standard discount rate. So we'll see the balance sheets here. So this is the way it works. So on the left side of the Fed's balance sheet, it's an asset. They make a loan to a primary dealer. They, the proceeds of that loan are credited to the primary dealer's reserve account. And to the primary dealer's ass or, uh, balance sheet, uh, they have now $1,000 in reserves and their liability, it's $1,000 uh, in one of these uh, primary dealer loans. Of course, the scale here, I'm just using a small number just for, to make it easy. The scale of these could be up in the billions of dollars, of course. The commercial paper funding facility, uh, the intent here is to increase liquidity in the commercial paper market. Uh, commercial paper are uh, 
securities issued uh, short term uh, by companies. And what they've done here is they've created what's called a special purpose vehicle. This is kind of an off balance sheet separate entity uh, that's wholly owned and operated by the New York Fed. And these are uh, specific entities to create it to hold specific types of securities. For example, in this case, commercial paper. So this special purpose vehicle will buy commercial paper. And there's, a, there's assorted limits. Uh, and what this does is this provides liquidity to the commercial paper market because financial market participants know that the commercial paper funding facility is there ready to buy appropriate uh, commercial grade paper. Uh, and for the, the uh, special purpose vehicle, the assets uh, are whatever paper it buys. And over on the right side, the Fed puts up the funding uh, for the liability side of the special purpose vehicle. The money market uh, mutual uh, fund liquidity facility. Money market mutual funds in the US are a particularly important uh, participant in the short term credit market. And what was happening here is that, um, as explained in the, in the bullet points, is uh, money market mutual funds were facing uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically large redemptions from their shareholders. And when their shareholders cash in, this forces money market mutual funds to sell their own uh, assets that they hold. So the market was flooded with short-term assets, including commercial paper, treasuries, and other things. And so some liquidity in that market was, was dramatically impaired. And so this liquidity facility is all about trying to support uh, the money market mutual funds. And the idea here is that uh, this uh, MMLF facility will lend money uh, to financial institutions and the collateral for these loans um, can be a whole number of other short-term assets. And the most critical of this, or these, uh, is commercial paper. And so effectively what's happening here is there's a market now, thanks to this, or, or will be when it starts operating, a market for commercial paper. And this continuing market for commercial paper will help support uh, the money market uh, mutual funds. The term asset-backed. Uh, securities loan facility. This is uh, right out of the uh, Great Recession. And uh, the idea here is to support uh, liquidity in the asset-backed markets. Asset-backed markets are um, things such as uh, um, securities backed by auto loans, student loans, credit card loans, uh, SBA loans, and so forth. And so what borrowers can do is they can put up these asset-backed securities collateral and borrow funds uh, from the Fed. And the reason the Fed introduced this is because these markets were also seeing lower liquidity. They were seeing a lot of sellers and relatively few buyers. The secondary market corporate credit facility uh, and its, its uh, cousin uh, that we'll look at in the next couple of slides. Here, the idea is to provide uh, liquidity for outstanding corporate bonds. So the Fed is going to create another special purpose vehicle. And the intent here is to buy investment grade corporate bonds and exchange traded funds that buy these bonds. And what they're doing is they're also getting a, uh, a boost here uh, on the treasury. So the treasury is putting up in their um, exchange stability fund, uh, exchange stabilization fund rather, uh, up to $10 billion. So again, this is the first year the Fed has never bought uh, corporate bonds or even ETFs before. And you also have the primary market corporate credit facility. This is the same idea as the, um, uh, secondary market facility, except this is for uh, new bonds. The only difference here is there's no uh, exchange traded funds involved. So the idea is that uh, the Fed is offering to directly buy newly issued uh, investment grade bonds, or at least that was the initial uh, setup. But on March 22, they announced that they would, they would buy uh, bonds that had been downgraded uh, below investment grade, but had been investment grade uh, no later uh, than March 22nd. These are referred to as, as fallen angels. So the Fed is taking these securities onto its balance sheet and it's taking uh, some default risk onto its balance sheet, surely. Uh, but there's a couple things. First here is the Fed uh, is going to absorb, excuse me, the Treasury is going to absorb uh, some of these losses. And these are also uh, recourse facilities, meaning that the Fed can go after uh, whoever tendered these bonds and go after them in case the, uh, the securities default. So the Fed might face some losses, but it does have a lot of backstop here. And so again, unless there's a really terrible situation, the Fed's losses will probably be uh, relatively modest and hopefully zero. Uh, and what was important here is that on the news of this, 
high yield bond rates, in other words, interest rates on securities with relatively low ratings uh, rose, uh, the, or the prices rose and the, the yields fell, uh, the idea being that the Fed is going to support this market. And so question here is, uh, how far down the ratings ladder will the Fed go? That's also sort of open to question because of course a lot of companies issue below investment grade debt and then are subject to the Fed's actions here. So the Main Street uh, Business Lending Program, the intent here is to provide uh, up to four year loans uh, to, to uh, firms with uh, no more than 10,000 employees or no more than uh, 2.5 billion a year uh, in revenue. And again, uh, like some of the other facilities, the, uh, the Treasury is putting up some equity into the SPV that the Fed will be uh, using here or to, for this particular program. Uh, the originator of these loans uh, has to keep 5% of the loan so that the originator has some skin in its game. So that gives the originator uh, some incentive to monitor the overall quality of the loan. And key here is that in order to qualify, uh, uh, companies have to make what are defined as reasonable efforts uh, to keep employees. Now, what is defined as reasonable, of course, uh, is probably probably going to be subject to uh, you know to some litigation at least at some point. Uh, this particular facility is not going to roll out uh, to at least uh, May first, and the the money, the funds, uh, probably won't come for some time after that. So. Uh, hopefully this will come relatively quickly because as is well known here now, uh, firms are pretty desperate uh, to, work to, uh, to get financing. Uh, the Paycheck uh, Protection Program liquidity facility, uh, the Paycheck Program, uh, Paycheck Protection Program is part of the CARES Act. This is the uh, $2 trillion government assistance program that provided uh, more generous unemployment benefits, uh, checks directly back to taxpayers and so forth. And these, uh, Paycheck protection uh, loans are, are part of uh, the intent to help keep uh, smaller businesses uh, functioning. There was a total of up to $350 billion available, uh, the first part of which has already been uh, uh, exhausted and the government is looking to try to negotiate some additional funds here. But what the Fed will do is they will buy these loans uh, at face value from originating institutions. And these loans uh, will be guaranteed uh, by the SBA. So again, uh, at least on the face of it, the Fed will not be subject, subjected to any losses. The municipal liquidity facility, uh, the whole point of this is that the uh, fiscal situation of state and local governments has been absolutely devastated. They've seen lower sales revenue, sales tax revenue, income tax revenue, corporate profit tax revenue, and so forth. Uh, and so states are experiencing dramatic shortfalls and so the purpose of this is to provide up to $500 billion uh, in short-term debt for relatively large cities and relatively large counties. Um, and what's important to note here is that clearly, you know, most cities and towns and most counties uh, that don't meet either the 1 million or the 2 million criteria uh, would seem to be left out. But uh, states uh, can borrow on behalf of the state and then they can disperse those funds to the smaller towns and cities and to the smaller counties. So they are, they are not left out by this. Uh, the Treasury, again, like with a number of other programs, is putting up uh, some equity to absorb losses. And what's important to note here is by supporting directly state and local governments, for better or for worse, the Fed is moving into the territory of fiscal policy. Um, now, there could be some issues long term with the Fed's independence, uh, but at least for now, uh, those issues are, are probably secondary. We have the Foreign and International Monetary Authority uh, repo loans. Uh, and so what the Fed is doing here, and this is kind of goes along with their uh, dollar liquidity swaps that I talked about earlier, uh, what they're doing is uh, allowing uh, foreign central banks who have uh, treasuries, U.S. treasuries on their own balance sheets to put those treasuries up as collateral and get dollar loans. And so the intent of this particular facility is to make sure that there is a, a ready market for the for these treasuries so that the, um, the foreign central banks don't feel pressure to sell them to acquire dollars. And so right now the, uh, the rate on this is a, a relatively low, you know, 0.35%. So all these policy actions uh, have dramatically increased uh, the Fed's balance sheet. It's increased by uh, nearly a trillion and a half dollars uh, in just the last uh, five weeks or so. 
and it's highly likely that this is going to uh, increase further. So you can see the, uh, the uh, structure here. So we've got treasuries, we've got mortgage-backed securities, and then the orange loan. These are some of the new uh, lending, uh, lending facilities to uh, institutions, and those are expected to, uh, expected to ramp up here pretty dramatically. So these are the lending facilities. So then in terms of how this is affecting the market for reserves, so we have a, a market for reserves uh, chart sort of already pre-drawn here. So over on the vertical, we have the federal funds rate, we have the quantity of reserves in dollars here on the horizontal. We have the supply of reserves curve here with the horizontal uh, portion given by the, the discount rate. We have the vertical portion uh, given by uh, non-borrowed reserves, the volume of open market operations. And then we have the demand for reserves curve. So we have the interest on reserves rate right here. And we have the ONRRP rate right here. And by the way, I should point out, we have a whole series of videos uh, on the reserves market that explain its operation in detail on our YouTube channel. So please see those. I'm skating over some of the details here. So the Fed's actions have had a dramatic effect on the reserves market. Uh, the elimination of reserves requir reserve requirements have effectively eliminated the vertical component here. The fact that the Fed moved the discount rate down to the top range of the federal funds rate means that the horizontal com component of the supply of reserves curves has shifted down. The Fed's QE programs have dramatically increased the supply of reserves, so that supply curve is shifting very far to the right. And then finally, the fact that the Fed has moved the uh, target federal funds rate down to the zero lower bound, zero to 0.25%. What they've done is they've lowered interest on reserves to 0.1% to actually. So interest on reserves are actually 0.1% now. And the ONRP has actually moved all the way down to zero. So those have been pushed down in order to push the federal funds rate down to approximately zero, just a little bit above it. So have the Fed's actions helped? Uh, so far, even with the fact that some of these new facilities are really uh, not very many of them are functional yet, uh, liquidity has improved pretty dramatically in many areas of the financial markets. Uh, markets seem to be functioning okay uh, based on trading volume and bid ask spreads and other metrics. Uh, credit spreads, meaning the difference between uh, uh, interest rates on risky assets and riskless assets, those have narrowed. And the use of the Fed's repo loans, I got got some visuals here in a second, uh, has, has fallen. Uh, so they're not getting up close to the, that $500 billion daily limit that we mentioned earlier in the, in, the, um, in the video. Is this going to be enough? Is the Fed's actions going to be enough? Not sure, but the Fed has already pledged action, uh, additional action if need be. So here's a couple of visuals. This is the uh, St. Louis Fed uh, financial stress index. It takes into account a number of metrics, credit spreads, yield curve slopes, and other things to try to gauge the degree of, of uh, difficulty that financial markets are experiencing. And so you can see here, this index was extremely elevated during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, hardly surprising. And you can see over here that initially it rose very dramatically, but that since then, as you can see here on the very far right, it has fallen back somewhat. We're certainly not back to any degree of normalcy, but relative to even what was happening at the, the worst of the uh, Great Recession, uh, things are not nearly that bad. Uh, and then finally, we have the overnight repos. Um, the volume here again was up to $500 billion a day. And as you can see by the horizontal, excuse me, the vertical axis, uh, that scale, that volume hasn't been nearly reached. And you can see that here in the last few weeks uh, in April, uh, total use of these facilities was down very dramatically. And that's suggesting that at least right now, that there's hopefully enough liquidity in the financial markets. This is not saying that the problem is solved by any stretch of the imagination, but at least that things are not as bad as they were. As you can see here in March, the Fed was making some, some pretty large loans. All right, well, thank you all very much for watching. And again, I'd encourage you to, uh, to seek out the other videos on our YouTube channel. Thank you all very much. Bye now.